at this time, but I would like to say about what Tiffany had done this morning. I'm reminded of a story, and I will tell her this personally, but I'm reminded of a story where David brings the Ark of the Covenant back home to the children of Israel. And the Bible said he danced before the Lord. Can I tell you this? He had to dance with the Lord in private before he could dance with the Lord openly. Yes. Because see, his wife looked at him, and this ain't the message, but his wife looked at him and was mad at him because he got naked and danced before the Lord. She didn't know what the praise cost. She didn't know what he had been through. She didn't know about all that happened at Obed-Edom's house. That's right. She didn't know what David was going through knowing that God's presence was not with His people. Yes, amen. So she could get mad all she wants to because David said, I'm going to dance before the Lord. And listen to me right now. You'll never be able to dance in this house until you can dance with the Lord in your, in your prayer closet. Yes, amen. Let me tell you something, folks. The Lord still moves on people to dance in the Spirit. Yes, the Lord still moves on people to shout. The Lord still moves on people to be touched and cry and be emotional. Because listen, you cannot serve the Lord without emotion. He made us that way. Yes. Praise God. So listen, don't let anybody stop your praise because they don't know what your praise cost. They don't know what that vial was that you just busted open. They said, why didn't you sell and give to the poor? Because this is for my Lord. Yes, amen. Hallelujah. I tell you what, I might preach here a little bit. I said, you don't know what my praise costs. I don't know what your praise costs. You remember that story I gave you last week about the man that danced? And I went to him and I was going to talk to him because it was a church I was pastoring and I come in and he was still dancing and I was a little bit not knowing what was going on. Just the Lord telling me I need to pray more. Because I went to him. And I told you this. They would start the music and he would start dancing and he would do different stuff. He would like to offer things to God and he would dance and he would twirl around. And, and it did it kind of bothered me. And I went to him after church and I was going to talk to him. And he saw me coming and before I even said anything, he said, Brother Todd, he said, I just want to tell you this morning, you may wonder why I dance. I just want to explain it to you. He told me he's on his deathbed. He told the Lord, he said his feet was had a disease that they were crippling up and turning under. He couldn't even walk anymore. He's bedridden. He told the Lord, he said, Lord, if you let me get out of this bed, he said, I'll never cease to praise you and never cease to dance for you. You see, sometimes you've got to take that that the enemy wants to cripple and use for the glory of God. Yes, Whoa! Hallelujah. Yes. It's going to be a good morning today, I can tell already. Hallelujah. I said, sometimes we've got to use the crippleness that the devil puts on us so we can praise God with it. Let me tell you something. David said, bring a fever chef to my table and put him under it. Woo! Hallelujah! It represents the Gentile. The person that's un imperfect. I'm that Gentile that he led under that table today. Now you want to know why my praise is so important? Because you're at the table of the Lord. Yes, amen. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. And if you don't want to praise Him, He'll replace you with somebody else. That's right. That's good. Yes. I didn't say He would replace you in church. I just said He would replace your praise with somebody else. Yes. yes. Okay, let's get started this morning. If you have your Bibles, turn with me. Praise God. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Let's look into Genesis chapter number 18 and verse number 19. Praise God. One quick scripture. Genesis 18, 19. When you get that, stand up. We'll read it together. This is the scripture. Right after the Lord had promised that Abraham and Sarah was going to have children. You think about a 100-year-old man and a 90-year-old woman thinking, we're our children. Now this is the Scripture that the Lord gave. Genesis 18, 19. For I have known him in order that he may command his children and his household after him. For I have known him, that's the Lord, in order that he may command his children and his household after him, that's Abraham, that they keep the way of the Lord to do righteous and justice that the Lord may bring to Abraham what He has spoken to him. Let us pray. Father, in the name of Jesus, we ask You right now for Your anointing. Lord, we know this Scripture right now is talking about the promises of Abraham. And Lord, You're going to bring it to pass. 
And we give You praise, Lord, that this is about Father's Day, but it accounts to every one of us this morning. We give You praise and glory and honor in Jesus' wonderful name. And everybody says, Amen. Amen. Praise God. You may be seated. The Scripture we just read is our Heavenly Father talking about one of our forefathers, Abraham. The promise of a son that Abraham would know what it is to be a father. Listen, up to a hundred years old, he didn't know what it was to be a father. Sarah didn't know what it was to be a mother. But now God, through this Scripture, says He wants Abraham to know what it is to be a father. Why? Because he's going to become a father of many nations. He's got to know what a father is. He's got to know the love. Listen, it is important this morning to understand that God wants us to be an earthly father to our children. Then we have our earthly fathers. Those fathers can be known in many different ways. And I want to commend all men today. Listen, we have biological fathers. We have stepfathers. We even have step-in fathers. This church and other churches that we pastored had men that had never had children, but they took the children and they blessed them and they put them under their wings and they took them and they never had a child, but they become a father to them. Yes. We had many men to do that. Yes. It's important for them to have role models and leadership. Listen to them. There's also absentee fathers and deadbeat dads. There may be more descriptions of father, fathers if we really think about it. What this all says is that being a father is complicated. Yeah. Being a mother is complicated. Being a parent is complicated. Amen? Can somebody say amen? Yeah. There is no... I want everybody to hear this. There is no one fixed step all for everything or anything except for calling on the Lord. There's not one fix quickly for anything yes. except calling on the Lord. We are all human with the exception of the Lord. And that means we are all imperfect. The best fathers fail, fail their children in some ways. We can't help it. That's why we need a heavenly Father. Somebody that will never fail us, never let us down. The Bible gives us, if not a job description, at least qualities of a good father. You see, any knucklehead can have a baby. but to learn and to grow and to mature to be a man of God is what we're aiming for. Yes. Can I tell you this? And I'm talking to this from experience. Nobody told me this. I'm telling you this from experience. That's the progression for a man. You have a baby. You're a knucklehead. My wife took care of the babies. I was a knucklehead. Amen? But the Lord wanted to take that knucklehead and make him a man of God. He wants to do that to every one of us. But unless we recognize that we need His help, it takes God to be a father. Yes, right. It takes God to be a dad. Yes. Somebody dependable. Somebody that's always there. Moms too. It's just as important. We all need the Lord. We need His Strength in His mercy. This morning I just want to share seven things a godly father does. Seven things we fathers need to strive for. The first one a godly father that they do, the first one is He is a teacher for their children. Do you remember that Jesus said the greatest command was to love the Lord with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your strength? Deuteronomy 6.5 but the Scripture doesn't stop there. Does everybody remember what it says next? The command doesn't stop. There's no period or comma. It continues in verse number 6. And these words... Now remember first that I'm going to love the Lord with everything that I have. Then verse number 6. And these words which I command you today shall be in your heart. You shall teach them diligently to your children. You shall talk of them when you sit in your house, 
When you walk by the wayside, when you lie down, when you rise up, tell your children about God. You shall bind them as a, you shall bind them as a sign on your hand, and they shall be as frontlets between your eyes. You shall write them on the doorpost of your house and on your gates. Deuteronomy 6, 6 through 9. Listen to what God is saying here. This is our commandment as parents. God is telling fathers and mothers that we have a responsibility to teach the children, our children, to love God with all of their heart. And He tells them how to do it. Listen to what He says. He tells them how to impress this command on the children. He says, talk about it when you sit down at your house. Or you're walking down the road, or can I say driving down the road, or on your way to road, uh, maybe to vacation. Talk about the Lord with your children. Listen, this is God's Word. This ain't me telling you to do this. This is God. He said, when you lie down to sleep, talk about it to your children. Yeah. Make sure you say your prayers. We have a responsibility. Listen to this. He says, and when you get up first thing in the morning, teach your children, God needs to be first. Yes. This is what the Lord's Scripture says. Now, I'm not going to ask you to raise your hand, but how many of us do this? It's, it's, it's self for us to look at ourselves and identify within ourselves. Yes. The teaching continues. He says it continues all day long. It never stops. Yes. You know, if there's one thing that your children want to know more than anything else is that you love the Lord. Yes, amen. And that you love Him. Yes. With all of your heart. Okay. Now, listen to what else He said. Tie those Scriptures in. Now he says on the forehead and the hands and write them on their door frames of their house and the gates of the city. Teaching doesn't happen by accident, folks. Yes. You have to teach on purpose. You have to plan it or it probably won't get done. Fathers, teach your children to love God. Amen. Now think about it. Everything that we do in our home should bring glory and honor to God. Listen to what the Proverbs says. Proverbs 22.6 Train up a child in the way they should go. And when he is old, he will not depart from it. He will not depart from that teaching that you have instilled in them. It didn't say they wouldn't go wayward. It said they would not depart from what you taught them. And if you don't teach them what God says when they reach that place in their life, they'll fail because they're not looking to God. Yes. You must teach your children. The New Testament says this in Ephesians 6.4, Fathers, do not provoke your children to wrath, but bring them up in the fear and in the admonition of the Lord. Don't provoke them to wrath. One of the most important things a father does is to teach their children. We're teaching them whether we want to or not. Whether it's good or bad, we're teaching them. Listen, if, you, if they're absentee fathers or deadbeat dads, they're teaching them that being a father aren't, isn't very important. But we that are really fathers... Let's teach our children that being a father is important and let's teach them that they'll be a good father even if their father wasn't. Right. Amen? Amen? And let them see that the church and that God has the answers for their problems of their yes. life. Amen. You didn't even know there was a sinner, but I'm fixing to tell you about a sinner. This is, the, <laughs> this is so funny, the National Center for Fathering. You didn't even know there was such a sinner, did you? It says this. They did a study. And this is what they come up with. I want everybody to listen. Kids observe everything. Yes, they do. That's their conclusion. And that's the greatest revelation of being a parent. How much they observe. This is something we as parents sometimes overlook or even underestimate. Now, I want you to listen to this. When we as parents do good things for others, the kids see and they understand how to treat and react and respond correctly. Yes. Now listen to this second part though. When we are not kind or understanding of each other, or we interact poorly with other people, 
Our children observe and know that as well because they observe everything. Yes. You want to know about prejudice, prejudice, racism? That's taught. Yes. It's not instilled by God. Right. Whether you're white or black or brown or red or yellow, that has never been instilled by God. That is a lie of the devil. Everything that's happening in America is nothing but a factual falsity of the devil. Yes, that's right. Amen. He has no power, no authority. What God has put together, let no man put asunder. Yes. What God has placed in this church, let no man tear it down or even the enemy. Yes. Children know. They see us. And whatever you teach them how to react and how to respond to situations is how they're going to live their life. Yes. And can I tell you this? We have now entered into the phase. We've done it in our teenagers and now they're just going younger. To don't respect authority and question everything. And can I tell you something? Sometimes by faith, you don't have to question anything. You just accept it by faith. You accept it by faith, the things of God. And listen, you have to instill in them. It's important to let your children see you interact with people. It's important that they see how you can come converse between two people. Now listen, we must teach them what it is because kids observe everything. Secondly, a father is to be a, le a leader. The scripture we start out with is our Heavenly Father explaining that the one of our forefathers, Abraham, has led uh, is to lead or direct his children. It even tells when he is to lead them what to do. The Bible says to keep the way of the Lord. Yes. What way is that? By doing what is just and right. Listen to the Scripture again. For I have chosen Him so that He will direct His children and His household after Him to keep the way of the Lord by doing what is right and just. In other words, living a righteous life. A father leads by example most of all. I love this Scripture that's in Joshua that's set up like this. Listen to the Scripture. And if it seems evil... He's talking to the children of Israel. And if it seems evil to you to serve the Lord, choose for you yourselves this day whom you will serve. Whether the gods which your fathers served that were on the other side of the flood are the gods of the Amorites in whose land you dwell. But listen to what Joshua said. I'm not serving either one of them. As for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. Amen. It's a choice. A father has got to stand up in his house and say, this is a house of the Lord and we will serve the Lord here. Yes. Yes. If you cannot declare that as the man of the house, then you are voiceless in your house. Yes. It's a choice. It's leading. Remembering when I was a young man and I was trying to be a leader in my family, but I had a problem. Now, I'm going to explain this next part before anybody says anything. My wife didn't necessarily always want to follow my lead. You remember back to that knucklehead? When I got married, my wife would have went to heaven and earth and hell for me. It was in her spirit. It was in her heart. But I messed it all up. Myself. She had no reason to trust me. She had no reason to follow me. Even though I was the man of the house. Because I was living a lie and wasn't living what I was professing and proclaiming. Now, in saying that, now you see where our predicament was. The predicament was I'd let her down so many times. And now, it was hard for her to follow me anywhere. And for me, now listen, a young man, I'm going to tell you, young men think different than old men. Well, when I get, when I get married, I'm going to get my whip out and I'm going to put my wife where she needs to be. And can I tell you, if I ever hear a man in here call his wife his old lady, I will take you outside myself. <laughs> <laughs> I 
She's your wife. She's to be praised and lifted up. She's not an old lady. It was very exasperating for me as a husband. Sometimes you just want to give up and let the strongest one lead. Even if that meant the wife leads. But listen, I prayed. I got my life right out right with God. I prayed and God communicated to me. Listen, this is what He said. That I was to lead. But whether Rhonda followed or not was not up to me. It was up to her. Right. And He told me to do, just pray. Now listen to what God gave me the answer. So I would say I think we need to do thus and so. And Rhonda had to have a personal experience with God where He communicated to her to trust me and to follow me. But it took time. It didn't happen overnight. She did and life got so much easier for both of us. I didn't have to lead alone. How many knows a man is not meant to lead alone? And I'm going to tell you, she is my partner. She is my helper. I ask for advice and we make decisions together. Husbands and fathers, don't shirk your responsibility of being a leader in your household. You be the leader. You stand up from time to time. And don't harp on things, but love your family. Yes. Thirdly, fathers need to learn how to discipline Listen to the Scripture. Proverbs 3, 11 and 12. My son, do not despise the chastening of the Lord, nor detest His correction. For whom the Lord loves, He corrects, just as a father the son in whom He delights. Proverbs 3, 11 and 12. Now listen to this. Hebrews 12, 6-11. For whom the Lord loves, He chastens. Yes. And scourges, and if you want to know what that word scourges means, every son whom he receives me, he actually spanks them. If you endure chastening, God deals with you as with sons. Now listen to this. For what son is there whom a father does not correct? But if you are without chastening, of which all have become partakers, then you are illegitimate and not a true son. Yes. Did you hear that? Furthermore, this is all Scripture, Furthermore, we have had human fathers who corrected us and we paid them respect. Shall we not much more readily be in subjection to the Father of spirits and lives? For they indeed for a few days chastened us as seemed best to them. But He for our own profit that we may be partakers of His holiness now no chastening seems to be joyful for the present, but painful nevertheless. Afterwards it yields peaceable fruit of righteousness to those who have been trained by it. What is that talking? Discipline is not easy, but it's needful. You can't raise a child without discipline. Yes. Amen. Now I want to tell you there's two types or two things. We want discipline, not just punishment. Yes. Right. Amen. Give me just a second. It's hard to believe when you're a kid, but discipline is an act of love. Because you always know that same thing I do. It's going to hurt me more than it does you. But not in the same place, but it does hurt as bad. Listen, you need to know the difference between discipline and punishment. Punishment causes rebellion. That's why when they let people out of prisoners, prison, most of them go right back. Discipline will draw you closer to your children. Punishment is spoken in anger and harshness. Yes. Discipline is usually spoken kindly and lovingly. Punishment produces bitterness and a poisonous fruit. Discipline produces the fruit of acting in the right way or righteousness. Now listen, fathers, this is for all of us. You need to learn the difference in discipline and not punish. Discipline will end up in both of you in tears. Enough said. 
if you talk to your children and you can share with them why you're punishing them or why you're disciplining them. I use the wrong word, I'm sorry. You sit down with them and you show it in the Word of God. Or you sit down with them and you show them where it's not right or where it will cause harm or destruction. I believe this with all of my heart. The majority of parents want to do what's right for their children. But listen, it is difficult. Yes. Making decisions are difficult. And can I urge you as parents to pray about it because sometimes the Lord might want you to do different than what you're thinking. But I can tell you this, if the Lord tells you to do it, He's going to send the Holy Spirit to cause it to be right. Yes. Okay, now listen. Discipline. Discipline is that that we need. That we share with our children. And whenever you're finished talking with them, you have connected in a way spiritually that you cannot if you just punish your children. The psalmist in the fourth one, a godly father has compassion on his children. The psalmist said this, As a father pities his children, so the Lord pities those who fear him. For he knows our frame. He remembers that we are dust in Psalms 103, 13, and 14. Sometimes a child doesn't need teaching or discipline or even leadership. They need compassion for them from their mother and father. Did you listen to what I said? Sometimes a child doesn't need teaching, discipline, or even leadership. They need a compassionate parent that will put their arms around them. A dad that will cry with their sons and daughters. A mom that will cry with their sons and their daughters. They need to know that you care. We've said this our whole ministry. People don't care how much you know. They want to know how much you care as a pastor. They don't care how, how intelligent you are. They want to know you do. You love me. Yes. Amen. we got to show our kids that we care. That we love them above everything else. Above grades. Above their wrongdoings. Above their right doings. We love them. Yes, amen. Right. Listen, I, I was one of the hardest ones to learn this lesson. Because I was always in a household that was strict. To follow the letter of the law. And it caused me to be hard when I got older too. The Lord had to soften my heart and teach me how to love my children properly. They need to know you feel their pain. Their passion. Isn't that what compassion is? Sharing someone's pain? Yes. It's hard for a man to do because we don't want to look like a sissy or a softy. But Jesus was a compassionate man. Amen? Yes. He even wept over a couple of occasions. The death of His friend Lazarus, He wept over. Going into Jerusalem and looking at that city, He wept over that city because He loved her so much. Hallelujah. Jesus wept. Man, men, don't be afraid to weep. There's nothing wrong with your children seeing you cry and I was raised up my dad was raised under his parents was raised up never let anybody see you cry you remember that generation come on say <coughs> him. don't ever let anybody see you cry but can I tell you this it's like a pop off valve if you don't cry every now and then you'll go insane later because you got to get it out of there. It'll start running around in your head and pretty soon it will overtake you. Yes. We've got to have compassion for our loved ones. We've got to have passion, compassion for our family. Fifthly, a godly father is there for you. He is not an absentee father. Listen to our Heavenly Father's witness and this is found in Matthew 28, 19 and 20. Then I said to you, do not be terrified or afraid of them. The Lord your God, He goes before you. He will fight for you according to all He did for you in Egypt before your eyes and in the wilderness where you saw how the Lord your God carried you as a man carries his son. Whew. 
and all the way that you went until you came to this place. Deuteronomy 1, 29 through 31, and this is Matthew 28, 19. Go therefore and make disciples all of the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all things that I have commanded unto you. And lo, I am with you always, even until the end of this age. Matthew 28, 19 and 20. A godly father is there for his children. He makes time for them. He makes a way for them. But that is not always the case here on earth. That is why we need a Heavenly Father. I wish I could be there for my children and my grandchildren, and I'm going to be there as much as I can. But I'm human and I have human limitations. We have a Heavenly Father who can be there always and forever. What we can't do, God can do. Our job is to lift the children up, teenagers, all ages, up in prayer to the Lord and to be there for them. Let them know that you are there for them. The number one thing that is missing from our homes. I was thinking about this the other day and I've kind of jotted down a few things. It's not finished, so I don't think it's uh, that great. But I was thinking, we're now living in generations. Right now, we're getting into a generation of people that have never lived without a cell phone. We're now living in a generation where kids, most kids have never stayed at home with their parents. They go to daycare. That, that's the generation we're living in. We're living in a generation where things are changing. They're, they're different than whenever I was a child and you were a child. And, and some of you were in that generation. And I'm not, I'm not down in that generation. I'm just trying to tell you that the mindsets has changed over the years. And I'm afraid some of the things that it tries to teach, the world tries to teach the church is that you're not who that God says that you are. Yeah. Amen? How many knows? And I'm not just stating this, but a lot of your colleges, even some of your colleges that was built on Christian principles today, now teach against Christianity and living for God. When kids go to school, they're not hearing anything about it. They're just hearing about education. Let me tell you something. Education is great, but it can't do anything without God. Right. You can be the smartest person in the world and wind up in a crack attic house with an intelligence of 150 IQ. Because it's not about intelligence. It's about the Lord. We try to point everything we can to everything else except for God. We've got to be there for our children. We've got to be there for one another no matter what happens. But listen, here's the key. And I'm going to say this and then we're going to get to the sixth one. When you send your kids somewhere that you cannot go, say a prayer over them and God will cover them. You cover them as much as you can. But when they're going somewhere you can or they're doing something you can't go with, you cover them with a prayer and God will cover them. Amen. Six. Almost there. A godly father provides for his children. This gets a little rough at times. He may not provide their wants, but he provides what they need. Listen to what the Bible says. If you don't provide for your family, you are worse than an unbeliever or an infidel. That's pretty heavy, isn't it? If you now this isn't talking about a sinner, this is talking about a Christian. If you do not provide for his own, especially for those of his household, he has denied the faith and is worse than an unbeliever or an infidel. Well, there it is in black and white. If we fathers do not provide for our family, we have denied the faith and are worse than an unbeliever. We have an obligation to provide for the needs of our family. And not just material, but fi our financial. There's emotional needs, spiritual needs. Jesus describing our Heavenly Father, describing Him compared to an earthly father. 
This is found in Matthew 7 and 9. Or what man is there among you who if he has a son that asks for bread will give him a stone? Or if he asks for a fish will he give him a serpent? If you then being evil know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your Father who is in heaven give good things to those who ask Him? Yes. Listen, Jesus portrays a good earthly father as someone who provides good gifts to His children, yes. good food to them, provides protection, provision. Fathers have a God-given responsibility to provide for their families. Once again, I want to say this, financially, emotionally, spiritually, materialistically, things that they need in their life if we do not provide for our children, then we are not a child of God. That's as simple as they can get it. Last thing is this. I'm going to close out on positive. Praise God. One last thing. In 1 Corinthians 13 and 13, the last part of that chapter says, and the greatest of these is love. A father needs to love his children. How do you do that? You know the wonderful thing about the Bible is it tells us how to do everything. Right. We just find it. This is found in 1 Corinthians chapter number 13, verses 4 and 8. Now I want you to hear what love is. Love suffers long and is kind. Love does not envy something else. Love does not parade itself around. It's not puffed up. It does not behave rudely. It does not be its own. It's not provoked. It thinks no evil. Does not rejoice in iniquity, but rejoices in the truth and bears all things, believes all things, and hopes all things endures all things and love never fails. Now I'll read those one more time. This is a scripture. It's 1 Corinthians 13, 4 through 8. Love suffers long and is kind. Sometimes do you lose your temper a little quick and you're not kind to people? Then you're not experiencing love in your life. Yeah. Come on. It's fixing to get a little tough. Love does not envy somebody else's gift. Love does not empty, envy somebody else's wife. Love does not envy somebody else's vehicle or house. If you're envying something somebody has and you want it, then love is not portrayed in your life. Let's go a little bit further. Sometimes we don't explain these things. Love does not parade itself. Look at me! Look at me! Look at me! Love wants to be hidden. Amen? Yes. Now think of this. A little bit further. It's not puffed up. Well, bless God, they didn't, they didn't acknowledge me. <laughs> Amen. Yeah. I love every one of you, and if I never tell you that, I love you this morning. <laughs> I need to tell you that often. That's right. See, I can learn too on the fly. Amen. Love does not puff itself up. Listen to this. It does not behave rudely. <coughs> Anybody in here ever got a little rude? Love wasn't pushing that. Isn't this good? Whew, I'm glad I stopped here. This is better than a road trip. And all y'all saying, are we there yet? <laughs> it does not seek its own. It's not provoked. Love don't care what you do to it. It's just going to love back. Right. If it does, it's, an, an, it's a conditional love. If you love only when people love you. But agape, unconditional love, means I'm going to love at all times. Right. That's godly love. We're not looking for earthly love. We're looking for godly love. Yes. Listen to this. It does not, it thinks no evil. It's not provoked. Thinks no evil does not rejoice in iniquity. All these things are we, if we are involved in, love is not the driving force, the love of the Lord, the salvation of God. But listen what it does rejoice in. Truth. That's right. 
Jesus said, I am the way, the life, and the truth. Amen. Bears all things. Love bears all things. Right. Believes all things. Right. Has faith. Hopes all things. Endures all things. And the last one is love never fails. I want you to do a self-examination when you get home and see what drives my life. Because I'm going to tell you this. And I'm going to be honest with you. That's what being up here sometimes does. I can do pretty good until I get overwhelmed and overstressed. And then I go a little bit berserk. Hey Amen? Just, I'm, I'm just saying how things happen sometimes. But if I allow the love of God to cover me, it will comfort me and bring me peace. Amen? Amen? Do it yourselves. Go home and see what you're driving you. Amen. And if something does happen, if something goes out of whack, because something always does, the Father needs to love. We need to know what it is to love. Some fathers, listen, some fathers just think bringing a paycheck home shows that they love their family. And it does. I'm not belittling that because God tells us to do that in the, a couple of lines up. But dad needs to learn how to love their children. There are ways we need to be told we are loved. Dads learn them. Your children, they need to feel love. I told you I was raised up. I'm 54 years old. Is that right? I think I'm 54. <laughs> I never can tell you one time my dad told me he loved me. Not one. It was just never implied, never said. I knew he loved me. I knew he would. I, I told my wife about this. And let me tell you, this is something that happened to me. And I'm just going to I'm, I'm gonna make it as friendly version as I can. My dad was inside and my mom and me was outside and I was playing. She was in the garden. She had made a flower bed in the front yard. And this man drove up. And um, my mom went out to where he was to see what he wanted to, uh, what he wanted. And immediately she took off running inside. He sped off and peeled out. And she went in and told my dad something and my dad come running out and got and grabbed me and grabbed my mom and I was scared to death. I was probably about nine years old. We took off. There's a bat that comes out of somewhere. We flew past him. <laughs> that man had exposed himself to my mom. We drove for ten miles through Pensacola through red lights and stop signs and did not stop. My dad was going to take care of him when he got in. And my mom started praying. And she calmed him down. And she says, it's not worth it. And I was so scared. But I'll tell you what, I know a situation that I was in. And I didn't understand it, Brother Jack. But all I know, my dad was going to take care of me. I was all right as long as I was in that car. And you don't never know what children see and what they hear. You don't know what some of these kids that go through. If you've seen what they had to live in, if you've seen what they had to eat at night, if you've seen what they had to lay their pillow down, we're not talking about third world countries. We're talking about people in America and even people in our own neighborhoods right. that don't have electricity right. and running water. Right. Don't tell me that this world don't need love. Learn how to tell your children that you love them. Yes. Let them know above everything else. And me and Sister Rhonda, we talked about this with our kids as well. It's our relationship with the Lord. Then it's our marriage. Then it's our kids. Then it's our church. Right. That's the formula for God. That's right. It's Him first. It's our marriage. And we had to learn that with our kids. It was our marriage. And then it was our kids. And then it was the church. Amen. You've got to learn it. You've got to learn how to love and how to teach and how to share. There are ways that we must do it. 
As I said, my my dad didn't do it for me. So therefore, it's thrusted into my generation. Another generation. The one thing about mothers and fathers, and you can say whatever you want to, but I'm just going to point to the statistics. If you find a, a family that is brought up in sin, and the Lord doesn't save them, 90% of the time, the kids follow in the parents' footsteps. So if you live in an alcoholic house or a drug addiction house, then you're going to find out that there's things that's happening that they need to be loved and encouraged. But they can't see that, the parents. All they see is the next. Not the kids. Everybody in here, your kids, your kids are a blessing. They're not a cursing. Amen. Sometimes we feel that way. And I know. It's just a brief moment. <laughs> They're flesh of our flesh. Yes, amen. As my mother-in-law would say, bone of my bone, blood of my blood. But whenever they walk in this church, spiritually speaking, they're blood of my blood, bone of my bone, flesh of my flesh. I'm not talking about only my children. I'm talking about everyone that's here. Spiritually speaking, we need to share love one for another. As I shared with you the last part, it's hard when you do not give something to your children and as I said a while ago, we, we, we do have a, we do call it a generational curse, but there's one thing about it, the blood of Jesus can break any That's curse. Right. Yeah, That's right. Any curse. But may I suggest to you this morning, if there's a line that's coming through your family and it's not what it needs to be, can you break that line today? Can you break it? That generational curse. I'm not going to live under that curse any longer. How many of you today? There's enough curses in this world for us to live up underneath one. Amen? I'm going to close out with this today. It's hard being a father today. It's always been. That's why after you have done your best, you lift up your family to the Lord in prayer. You bring them to church. You go to Bible study with them. You have devotions with them. But above all, introduce them to their Heavenly Father and you will have done what God has placed your children in your hands to do. There's one thing that we do as parents. We had one not too long ago. A baby dedication. When God gives a, a parent a baby, we as a church, we feel like that we can take that baby that God gives it to us to raise and to care for. But the baby belongs to the Lord. That's right. We dedicate it back to God. Amen? Yes. That's something we do. And we do understand when we pray over those babies, it does not seal them for heaven. But we're dedicating them back to God. Listen, church. It's time that we dedicate ourselves back to God. Amen. We could stand to our feet right now. I know I gave you a lot of things this morning, but I'm telling you there are things that will help as far as a parent, mothers and fathers, not just fathers, but together, along with the church, along with the Lord, everything working for the goodness of God's anointing and His and His Word our life. Lord, we thank You today. 
We thank You for the earthly fathers that are here. We thank You for the mothers that are here. God, give them a special anointing, God, to minister to their children, to meet the needs of their family. Not only the mothers, but the father and the mother together. Lord, as a unit, as one, when we get married, God, You say those two become one. And now they're single. That marriage is together. And Lord, whenever we have a family and those children come into our family, they're still one. It's still one. It's one family that we have brought into the kingdom of God. And Lord, that You're watching over today. I ask You right now to lift us up and to strengthen us today. God, give us a love that will go beyond what we're doing in our children and grandchildren's life. Lord, help us establish and instill in them the Word of God that they would hide it in their heart that they might not sin against You. But Lord, our children will never hide their Word in their heart until we teach them how to hide it in our hearts. That's right. Lord, let us be an example today. I pray right now for everyone that is in this building, God. You're still working on each one of us, Lord, and we're not what we're supposed to be yet. But God, I ask You right now by Your fresh anointing, Lord, to open up our hearts and our minds and show us, Lord, by Your anointing that there's things that need to be different in our life and in our minds and in our spirit today. We give You praise and glory and honor. We thank You for it. We praise You. We magnify You. Be with everyone today. Minister to their families. Lift them up in spirit and in truth, Jesus. We give You praise. We glorify You. If I could just have You to look one more time up here. I'll do one more thing. If you want to really be bold, if you're a parent or a grandparent and you want to really be bold, Go home and ask your kids what do they think about you? And what do they see you do most of the time? When they answer the question, be big enough to accept what they say because it's probably not going to be flattering because our examples for our children are not up to standard. Amen? Amen. Are you willing to do it? Just do it. I mean, this, this is how we grow. You see what's wrong with what's been wrong with the church too long is this. We find a problem and then we just pray about it and hopefully it disappears. And how many knows that never happens? Anybody ever look behind you and see the snowball getting bigger and bigger? <coughs> Sometimes the Lord says we need to address things. And we need to deal with it. See, what's really been wrong with the church is we've been teaching people how to live right or how they're supposed to, to do what they're supposed to do for the kingdom of God. But we don't force ourselves to change into what it says. If God says I need to be something and I'm not, I need to change, not God. But for so long we said, oh, just be just be like you are, and one day it'll just flip a switch. No, that ain't gonna happen. You gotta deal with it. Amen. We Amen. love you. We appreciate you. I hope it was a blessing to you today. God bless you. I don't know.